uh, Ryan has traveled from Boston to be here today, so we can't ignore him. And based on his work at Boston Retail Partners, Ryan's going to give us his insights to relating to technology strategies in his presentation, retail, synchron retail synchron synchronicity, retail, and retailing. So please welcome Brian. Thank you. So even though my company is based in Boston, you can't hate me for the Patriots because I actually live in Dallas, Texas. So... <laughs> If you want to hate me, hate me for the Dallas Cowboys, uh, which is perfectly acceptable. Um, thank you all very much uh, for, for coming here today and, and inviting uh, myself to speak. As mentioned, my name is Ryan Grogman. I work for a company called uh, Boston Retail Partners. I'm not a uh, salesperson. I'm a delivery consultant, so I'm not a professional speaker either. Um, so I'm very worried now of this talk of body language. Like, a lot of people are, a lot of people are crossing their arms right now, so... Maybe if everyone could just do this for a second, <laughs> raise your eyebrows. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I am obligated a little bit just to talk for one slide, uh, or two, actually two slides about who our organization is. BRP Consulting, we're a retail management consulting firm. All we do is focus in the retail industry. Um, so we help them solve business and technology problems. Every single one of our consultants, uh, everyone in our company has actually spent time in the retail industry as well. So we feel like we know retail um, pretty good. Some more stats there. I'm going to skip those. Uh, we also do a lot of thought leadership. So every year we publish five or six surveys, um, state of the point of sale, uh, unified commerce, merchandise management strategies, uh, restaurant hospitality uh, surveys and white papers. Um, also put out a lot of special reports based on the findings from those surveys. There'll actually be some stats in my presentation today that draws from uh, information that we've gleaned from some of those surveys as well. Uh, and we get quoted in a lot of press uh, a lot of the time. That's the, that's the boring stuff, right? So that's out of the way. Let's talk about now. Let's talk about the state of retail. And let's talk about some, some really good news. Um, yeah, honestly, honestly, we're, we're all screwed, right? I mean, I got 18 minutes left. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, no, right? It's, come on. It's the retail apocalypse, right? We, we've been hearing about this for a, a couple of years now. This is not the case. It's change, right? It's, it's change. And it's, uh, as Julie mentioned, wherever she went, right? The disruption is the new constant state, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about disruption today, what that means to our consumers and how we can kind of react to that as retailers. So, um, you know, a little history, right? Let's talk about uh, not too long ago, right, things were pretty good in retail, right? Folks were coming in our stores, they were going to our shelves, buying stuff they needed, hopefully buying stuff they wanted on top of that, going and checking out, paying for it, going home, feeling good about their product. And then, uh, you know, and then something came along that kind of changed all that, right? It changed uh, everything about retail. It changed the way people browse for our products. It changed the way that uh, the supply chain, it changed the way that product got fulfilled uh, to them. Um, any thoughts on what that might be? Sears and Roebuck. It was the catalog, right? The late 1890s, uh, a catalog came out. And this threw traditional retail on its head, right? No longer people didn't have to go to stores. They can order and receive goods via post. It changed the way they pay for things. It changed the way um, that they got them. It, it opened up literally a deeper catalog of products to consumers and opened up the company itself to hundreds and thousands of customers that normally wouldn't have access to one of their stores, right? So this thought of disruption, right? It's not just the internet, it's not just Amazon. This has been a constant evolution, right? Retail, retail is not dying, right? Retail is just changing and it's continuing to evolve. And uh, you know, in today's digital world, we have this whole you know, sense of this on-demand uh, economy, right? Putting me, me first, I wanna get this now, uh, when I want it, how I want it, right? And that's, that's just changing the way that uh, our customers are shopping. And so we as retailers just have to be better uh, and respond to that and change to that, right? So, and I think so many leading retailers have done such an amazing job. Uh, a lot of the brands that I've seen are in this room here, some of these award winners, obviously most folks are already adapting to this. My, my presentation today is really just to talk around how we can take some of those lessons learned from the digital world and then how do we apply them uh, to the in-store, physical brick and mortar world, right? Um, so where are kind of things at today, right? So one thing that this digitized world 
uh, has really done is heightened consumer expectations, right? So things that folks didn't used to care about are very important to them now, and they have very high expectations for anyone that they want to spend their time uh, or money with, right? So you think about um, retailers having to react to that. These things, these things were there before, and these consumers are changing quickly and quickly, and retailers, a lot of retailers were lagging behind. So you see this kind of growing gap between things that are now just expectations, table stakes, if you will, for customers, and retailers are falling behind. Just, uh, you know, I won't read all these off, but, uh, you know, a couple of them, this, this top one right here, right? Almost three out of every four customers wants the ability to look at their orders and track, you know, the payments across multiple channels. Seems pretty common. We all probably do that, right? If I buy something in Nordstrom online, I want to be able to go to the store and maybe find out where it's at. If I buy in the store and it's a special shipment, I want to be able to go online on my phone and check it out. Less than 15% of retailers feel like they do that really well today, right? A lot of them have a mechanism to do that, but less than 15% feel like they actually do that pretty well. 72% um, of customers want to stop, shop at a store that has Wi-Fi. Less than 20% offer Wi-Fi, right? So these are just, just a few examples, and, and we have some of the stuff in our consumer surveys that you can download from our website. I'll give you the, the link at the end. <laughs> So what do we have, right? We have, we have a gap. Uh, we have a gap that's not exactly uh, shrinking, all right? It's actually, it's actually getting wider. So how do we start thinking about those ways that we can, like, again, take those lessons from that digital kind of uh, environment and apply those to, the, to, the, to the, re the real world? Not the real world, the physical world. So that's the topic of my presentation today is real-time retail. Uh, I'm going to focus on three different areas. There's a bunch more, but the three I want to talk to you guys about today was is personalizing the experience, taking advantage of mobile, uh, and implementing unified commerce, uh, whatever that means. We'll talk about that. It's a consulting buzzword. That's what I do. Uh, starting off with personalizing the experience, right? So focus on the customer. Seems pretty obvious, right? But it's more than just hanging a poster in the back office of your store that says the customer is number one, right? I mean, this is truly focusing on the customer and thinking about the customer in every aspect of how you deal with them, right? So you think about the customer journey, this wheel. Every retailer has some concept of a customer journey, right? It's not just that little box or whatever point on the wheel that just says shop, right? It's not just when we have that customer in our stores. Think about all the ways that we interact with our customers, how he or she wants to be uh, marketed to, right? Think about all the things that our customers are doing to research our brands, our products, our prices. Think about what those strategies might be. And it's different for every retailer, right? The customer journey, the personas, if you will, that get built off of understanding who your customer is, they're gonna be different, but it's an exercise that we have to undertake and think about, you know, how do we put the customer at the forefront of every single one of those strategies from the research process through, yes, when they are in our stores, right? What are we doing to make it more experiential, right? What, what are we doing to create a, a fun, personalized environment for them? Uh, through the actual purchase, right? So many. There's so many uh, new, cool, modern ways to pay for things with mobile devices and whatnot. Uh, are those something that's important to our customers? If so, is that the strategy that we have in place? Uh, certainly, the delivery of products and return of products, right? Is he or she, are they, is, is it a high return environment? Do we want, really need the ability to have all those kind of online use cases we're buying online, returning in store? Those may or, not be, may, or may not be important to your consumers uh, specifically today, but I guarantee you it's just, again, it's that customer expectations to be able to do these sorts of things all across this wheel, you've really got to put your customer first, including up through feedback, right? After the sale, how are you continuing to talk to that customer? Um, how are you, what are you doing to invest in that relationship when they're outside of your store to get them to start the wheel over again and come back in? <clears throat> um, talk a little bit more about personalization, right? So if any of you read retail trade uh, newsletters or attend industry events uh, such as this, right? Personalization has been a big topic for the past couple of years, how to battle the Amazon effect, what's all about personalization, right? When you got them in the stores, there were some great anecdotes earlier about uh, you know, creating that experience. This is something that's important to your customers, right? Over almost four out of every five customers have stated that they feel like a personalized experience with that uh, salesperson is important to them, right? It's a, it's a critical factor in determining where they want to shop. And uh, the retailers that we surveyed, you know, over half had customer identification and personalization as their top priority uh, coming into 2019 in terms of business and technology strategies. So what does that mean though, right? How does, like, what, what do we, what is personalization? How do we do that in the stores, right? So this is, uh, it's really about two different things, right? First, you have to identify your customers. And, you know, here there's a couple 
tactical items up here, right? Some very specific technology things that you can do to try to identify customers, whether it's through you know, Bluetooth, uh, near field communications, or beacons, or uh, getting the MAC addresses of phones as they come in your store and trying to pair that up with data you may have uh, you know, in your back offices. That's certainly one thing. Um, there's other creative things you can do as well, right? Um, mobile websites, you know, mobile apps, or customer Wi-Fi, right? We stated that customer Wi-Fi is an important thing to customers. If you offer customer Wi-Fi, right, have a splash page where you collect information about them or have them log on to the app when they come in the store for special you know, promotions and, and pricing, perhaps. Right? So now you've gotten this, some of that customer information from them while they're in your store. And if you have the systems and everything else in the back end talking together, and if you've got that real-time infrastructure behind the scenes, now you can send an alert you know, to someone's mobile device in the sales floor that we've got a you know, tier one uh, shopper, you know, Ryan's in your store. Oh my gosh, who doesn't want to go sell Ryan something, right? Um, uh, the problem is that top bullet, right, is uh, most retailers, I think it's 67% um, uh, of the ones that we surveyed, are unable to identify the customers until checkout, right? So we don't, it's not until they're, they're scanning and we're saying, oh, can I get your loyalty number? Or can I look at your license? Or do you want me to scan your code? Or do you want to enter your phone number into our pin pad device? The point is that's too late. Probably should have led with that bullet. But the point is it's too late. Uh, and so we've got to find other ways to identify those customers early in the transaction. What do we do when we identify who this customer is, right? Well, here's some things we can do. Here's some of the things that retailers are doing to try to uh, execute on that personalization, right? Suggestive selling. It's a pretty easy one, right? You think about all the things that our customers have come to expect when they go to a website. The website greets them, knows who they are. Well, how do we start applying that in the stores as well? Well, we can offer them the same kind of things. If we know who they are, we can have systems that are serving up the same type of suggestive sell. We can train our sales associates to get better about bringing up past customer history, looking at things that they've put in their shopping cart, things that they've bought, things that they've put in their virtual closet, offering personalized uh, promotions based on the type of customer they are. If you have a loyalty program, right, personalizing the rewards, not just a, I've, I've got 10 visits, so I'm getting 20 points. No, right, make it about me. Give me some, you know, Ryan uh, rewards. That's a great idea, Ryan rewards. I like that, trademark that. Um, and then additional things, right, G giving your customers access to their previous history as well. They're not going to maybe know all that, but if you have a sales associate in the floor with a device that can bring up past history, I see you bought this, I see you bought this, might be a good opportunity. You might be due for a new pair of running shoes because it's been... Probably 10 years since I've had running shoes. Um, communication purposes, right? Everyone has a, a different feel and flavor for how they want to be talked to by a retailer, right? We get those in emails and things online. Don't email me. Once a week is okay. Um, I want to know everything throughout the day. Please email me 10 times. You can do that in the store as well, right? If in, with some of the new laws and stuff coming, communication preferences and being able to pull people out of databases and uh, monitor what they do, right? There's going to be more and more of that, uh, not just California in the coming, the coming years. <clears throat> um, next topic I want to talk around is taking advantage of mobile, uh, the mobilization of retail, another kind of consulting phrase to put on there. Um, this is, again, about continuing to heighten that experience through the use of mobile. I want to break this down into three areas. The first one is our sales associates, right? So, um, We've got really smart customers coming to our stores. They've done a lot of research. They know a lot about the products. They know a lot about your competitors' products, including the pricing. You need to make sure that your salespeople know as much information, I mean, hopefully more, but at least as much information as your customers are coming into armed with. And you can't know, you can only train them so much, right? Things, information is dynamic and changing. So give them access to the power of the internet, Right? Give, your, give your associates mobile devices the ability to look up in-depth product information on your own products, the ability to look up competitive pricing, uh, the ability to look up information about the customer like we talked around in the previous slide. Um, the next is around you know, point of sale. We talked around some really cool stuff that we can do in the stores to change that experience. Right? Some retailers are getting amazing and we're bringing back retailers theater, right? making an exciting experience to be there. But then it's like, you're excited, you got your products, and then you got to go wait in line for five minutes. And that sucks, right? There's nothing exciting or experiential about waiting in line. No one wants to do that. So uh, more than just line busting at the holidays, right? A mobile point of sale allows you to consummate that sale out on the, sale, on the, on the sales floor if needed, right? You're going to decrease your abandonment. Folks that are maybe hemming and hawing, they, don't, they see the line, yeah, maybe I'm not going to wait. Over half the customers won't wait in the line over five minutes uh, if they perceive it to be over five minutes. So get that sale out there. Capture it when you can, right? Uh, and the last one is, you know, our, our customers, right? All of your customers are coming into 
our stores with basically unlimited information and unlimited processing power in their pockets or their handbags, right? All of our customers have phones with them or tablets or devices. They have information available to them. Tap into that, right? Mobile websites, mobile, mobile apps. Um, sorry, I forgot which slide this was here. 63% of customers are using their phone while they're shopping, right? Actually, I'm actually surprised it wasn't higher. Like if you go in a store, uh, everyone's got their phone out, right? Maybe they're not always doing something for shopping, but 63% uh, from our survey are using it to do things like compare prices, look for offers and coupons. This is critical, right? This is a great opportunity to get more engagement with your, with your customers, right? Think about, uh, like I said, Think about your own websites. Do you have a mobile version of that that's you know, more easily read when they're on a device? Do you have an in-store mode for your mobile website or your mobile app? Right? Think about like the Kohl's or the Home Depot's uh, or some of those other folks that do that, do that well. Right? You can increase, if you have an in-store mode, uh, there's a stat, you can increase your interactions and engagement with the customer over five times uh, by having that. Right? The ability to call a virtual assistant, to be able to see specifically which shelf in this store has a product that I'm looking for. Right? Again, just good opportunities to to take advantage of that engagement. Uh, the last one is implement uh, unified commerce. Uh, again, so I'll try to define that uh, for you uh, in the best consulting way that I can. So on the left side of this chart, it makes sense, right? Single channel, sure, we've all been there, done that. You're shopping in the store, or maybe it's online only. Multi-channel, right? This is what most folks have been doing on and off for the past almost 20 years or so. This is, you know, we've, I can go, I can shop this retailer's catalog. I can shop this retailer's website, or maybe I can go shop their store. They may or may not have the same prices. Hopefully they do. Uh, it's a little bit look, different look and feel. Uh, maybe it's, I can't, you know, buy something here, return it here. I'm kind of restricted to that specific site. That's kind of where the majority of retailers have been, uh, at least over the past decade. Uh, Omnichannel is a buzzword, right? That's got a lot of tension in the past probably three, four, five years. This is when you start bringing in some of those, uh, those use cases that I've already mentioned before, right? Buy online, buy in here, pick up here, reserve here, pick up in the store, buy anywhere, return anywhere, right? And to the customer, it all seems the same, right? They're, they've got a consistent brand, feel, look. Um, it seems like they know information about you, whether you're in the store or you're online. It seems like you have a good ability to, to return things. The problem with Omnichannel is that most retailers that do it it is duct tape and bubble gum behind the scenes, right? Um, I don't know if many of you are in uh, the IT departments, but you can attest to that, right? It's, it's a lot of stuff that was put together quickly because someone made a commitment to Wall Street or some you know, C-level executive said, oh, we're having you know, buy online, pick up a store by next holidays. And so IT works and makes it happen, but it, it wasn't built from the ground up that way, right? So what unified commerce is, is building out our systems the right way so they kind of talk to each other. It's still giving the, the customer side, right? To them, it's still being able, it's still a common look and feel, but it's a smoother, it's a more efficient process behind the scenes. And what it really drives is, you know, common uh, systems and common data. So now, you, now we're really getting to the heart of what real-time retail is, right? So it's, it's a single view of the customer. It's a single view of product information. It's consistent product pricing, no matter what channel someone's browsing that product in. Uh, it's, it's true inventory availability, right? Inventory availability is a great one. So many retailers feel like, yeah, I know, I know, my, I know my inventory, right? If you go on a website, you can find it. Most retailers really don't, right? It's usually when you're talking about store data, you're probably getting store information based on store sales from yesterday, right? It's batch data that's come in. You've got real-time information that's hitting the website. You're using some sort of safety stock algorithm number to say, well, we should have those, you know, but we'll put a little disclaimer on the website just in case someone gets there and we actually had a run on those and they're gone, right? So uh, having common systems and common data bases, data lakes behind the scenes really allows for a single version of the truth of this data. Accessible from any device, right? Uh, and available in real time. There are vendors out there that this is where most of the retail technology vendors, order management systems, ERP systems, point of sale systems, this is where they're all going, right? I'm not here to pitch any one of them. Uh, we help companies based on their needs pick who the best for them. But this is where the technology space is going and this is where as retailers we've got to get to as well, right? This, this concept of unified commerce, real-time data. So in conclusion, right, um, this on-demand economy and this internet world, it's changing our customers' expectations and we've got to get better at changing. And we got to get better at changing faster, right? We've got to respond quicker. We've got to, um, you know, be more nimble and more agile. And 
and anticipate that this change is going to happen even more frequently as, as we get forward, right? So uh, thank you all for your time today. I do have one minute if anyone has any, any questions, and I'll probably be uh, drinking at the happy hour if anyone wants to talk to me there. <laughs> yes, sir? Blockchain. Blockchain. Yeah. What about it? Well, I'm not deploying it, but yeah, retailers, um, yeah, I mean, I think blockchain has certainly moved beyond the financial services industry, right? I think you can, you can think of any, so there's a whole other presentation I could give on, uh, you know, payment security and protecting consumer information, right? PII, personal identifiable information, blockchain is a great uh, use case for ways that some retailers are starting to use that to kind of create that chain of custody across, you know, owning the whole customer record, um, Behind the scenes, right? A lot of those data lakes I was talking about, right? You can use the blockchain to really kind of create that single instance of the customer. So, yeah. Yes, Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good one because payments has certainly taken some different unique paths uh, since a lot of the breaches right back in 2013 and 2014. Most retailers don't want to be in the payment space, uh, right? They don't. I mean, they want to collect payments. Don't get me wrong. They don't want to own any payment systems, right? And even the a lot of the technology vendors are like, well, I don't really want to own that either, right? No one wants to touch that stuff because it's so dangerous until something like blockchain, you know, can help solve those problems. So. Um, Really, I think most of these payments are being kind of carved out of a lot of these unified commerce systems. Uh, you, on the online, you have the concept of the hosted pay page, right? Like you can wrap your system, but you want to go pay, go you know go somewhere in the cloud that's hosted by a processor or you know an Apple Pay, right? Mobile wallets. Again, all these systems are going to integrate with them, but most of them aren't going to drive or actually own any of that payment logic. If that makes sense. So what's that triggering uh, in terms of when. Yeah, well, I mean, I think on, for the retail systems unification, I think you're going to see that playing out over the next two to three to five years. Um, that's where most of the tra traction is going to be. And then I said payments, you know, they'll always be a part of it, but they're going to be a little separate just because no one wants to own payment data anymore. So, all right, that's all the time I have. Thank you all again very much for your time. I appreciate it.